lecture, so we're going to get started. And thank you again all for, for being here. I'm John Levesque, as I mentioned. I have a life hack tip for you. Uh, in early March, I moved from Florida to the great state of New Mexico. And three days after I arrived, um, New Mexico, as well as the country, shut down. So my hot tip is don't move across the country at the beginning of a pandemic. So I hope you can take that advice and, and learn from my for my uh, past mistakes. So I'm honored to be leading our discussion today and I'm joined by three panelists who we'll get to hear from in just a few moments. Um, I first wanted to provide some additional context about why this topic is important. And when, I'm, and just from my experience, when it started, the pandemic started, I felt really disconnected. I felt afraid. I felt um, unsure. Uh, uh, where to put my professional focus. It took me a beat or two or five uh, to grasp as fully as I could at the time um, what I needed to do. And not only was I dealing with my own uncertainty, but as the program head for our employee uh, resource networks here at Wells Fargo, I had over 300 enterprise leaders and 70, 76,000 members asking me, what now? So not only was uh, we all were dealing with our own stressors and family situations and, and all that change. And for those of us who have direct reports and other responsibilities, managing or directing other folks, it just added another layer of, of pain and unsurety. So, um, so now we're into this. And it was an interesting few moments when, back at the beginning. 250,000 of our Wells Fargo employees, for the most part, were working from home. Vast majority of those working from home for the very first time. So we were juggling all that was happening. Everyone was afraid. We were adjusting to this new world order. We all wanted assurance. We wanted to feel safe. And what I discovered was that many of our ERN members, we call our uh, resource networks, employee resource networks, uh, everyone just wanted to feel connected somehow uh, to each other. Uh, we have a really close and tight uh, feel uh, within Wells Fargo, and it's, it's a beautiful culture that, that we've created um, in many, many ways. So as, as part of today's discussions, uh, we're going to talk about what our panelists and their organizations did and continue to do to meet this challenge. And we'll uncover some of the ways that we tried to connect to each other, and we'll share some of the opportunities we uncovered um, to refocus effort and looking back what we might have done differently now that we're seven months into this. Over and above the pandemic, other um, issues have come up, uh, social justice, um, some stuff in the press, and we'll talk about all of that and how we've gone through a lot of different crises over the, over the course of time. So I'm going to stop after the first three slides. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So because you'll just see our beautiful faces and the rest of the slides are just are just our pictures. Um, so I'm going to decide I've decided and been coached to stop sharing our, my screen in, in just a few minutes. But first, I want to introduce um, our first panelist and I've spent and the three of us have spent time together over the past few weeks, and I know you'll get a lot of what they have to say, and I'm really grateful to uh, all of our panelists to, to take this time and, and to be with us today. So let's say hello first to Erica McConduit. She is from Centene. Her information is on the screen. So Erica, thank you for being here. I remember you shared how the early days of the pandemic gave you some time to dig into some pending projects. I'd love to hear more about that. And, and what you did and how you got started focusing on um, those early days and, and how did you leverage that that time when we were all just sort of like, wow, what's going on? Right. So welcome, right. Erica. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. And hello, everybody out there. It's exciting to be with you this morning. Um, I just have to say, because John highlighted his little fun fact, I'm going to highlight mine before I answer and say, I grew up wanting to be an actress. So I'm going to ask you guys to bear with me on this journey today because I can be very eccentric and animated. So just go with it. <laughs> um, but I will tell you that, yes, I mean, like John said, I mean, a pandemic, like who was prepared? No one. Um, and so it really gave us um, an opportunity to stop and say, okay, look, how do we shift? 
how do we reevaluate? How do we adjust and normalize to the extent possible so that we can create some sense of balance for our workforce? We have a workforce of about uh, 75,000 people um, who, to be honest, Centene is a healthcare company. We are a work from work company. Um, and so we did not we did not even actually have the infrastructure in place. Um, so we quickly had to pivot to be able to send, you know, 98% of our uh, workforce home um, and to be productive. But we also knew that going through something like a pandemic created a lot of angst for people. Um, and so how do we as an organization respond in a way that creates, um, you know, more stability, if at all possible. So we really leaned on our, we call them EIGs, our employee inclusion groups, um, to step up to the plate and be the conduit, if you will, no pun intended, um, to, to help uh, really leverage um, creating connections in what felt like a very separated world uh, in an isolated world and so you know we said okay look what what did we always talk about that we wanted to do that we didn't really have enough time to do we wanted to invest more in our eigs we wanted to think about how do we scale programs how do we think more globally and make sure that we are reaching and touching the masses we're asking our eigs to create programs but how do we make sure they're scalable across the enterprise how do we improve our communications our planning our budgeting right all of these things. So we took the time, John, to really invest in a platform, a new user platform for all of our members of our EIGs. It created such an ease of accessibility, connection. We talked a lot about intersectionality and cross-programming to say, okay, if we're going to plan bigger, since everybody's just like we are now at our screens, if we're going to plan bigger, how do we make sure that we're doing things that are relevant to all of our EIGs across the board. Um, and so we, and we put the resources behind um, our EIGs to do just that. Um, so we had big names come in in terms of programming. We took on real sensitive content um, to make sure that we were being very transparent with the workforce and you know, vulnerable um, and going in spaces that as, a, as corporate America, we just typically don't tend to to venture into. Um, and so I think for us, it was, it was an opportunity to say, how do we step up in a way um, that creates the type of connections that people are really yearning for and needing um, if we're going to continue to have an inclusive culture um, in a remote setting, which again was really unprecedented for an organization like ours. So it, it, it really took us leaning in, creating more um, dynamic programming, really talking more about cross programming, investing more, um, and certainly doing things like the infrastructure so that we can create greater optimization across the board during the pandemic. It was a crazy time, and I'd love to hear crazy more. Time. Crazy. It's fun. Yeah. We took out, you know, yeah, it was a fun time. We built DNI dashboards um, to say, you know what, let's dig into the data so that when people talk about real outcomes, let's, you know, let's make sure that we're doing these very thoughtful and intentional projects right now. <laughs> it was, um, it was really interesting. I, you mentioned that you increased the number of events and the quality of your events, I'm sure, um, went along with that. One of the things just quantifiably, yeah. um, I did a year by year comparison of the number of events that our ERNs did in 2019 during the same period of time as 2020. And we were able, after everyone kind of shook off the, the cobwebs after this first got started, we have done almost two times as many events this yeah. year during this time than we did last year during this time. And because it's yeah. easier in some ways to get people connected mm -hmm. virtually than it is to have uh, in-person meetings um, and for a variety of other reasons. And I thought that was really interesting. So, so thanks for bringing that yeah. up. Um, I'm gonna, and we'll come back to you. You're not done yet. We're not, we're not through with you yet. <laughs> so next okay. up is, is Gary o o Osif Chin. I yeah. got it. And got uh, it. he's with Ferrara Candy. And uh, Gary, we'll let you introduce yourself and, and tell your, uh, your fun fact, and then I'll, I'll open it up with a question for you. Sure, so Gary, welcome, welcome aboard. Thanks, John. Hi, everybody. I'm representing my background here, some of our candy. If you don't know Ferrara, we are 
a hundred year old company, but we've acquired a lot of brands like Trolley and Black Forest Gummy Bears and Sweet Tarts and Keebler Cookies. So lots of sweet stuff um, and a really great uh, place to work where DNI is a, a focus for us. My little fun fact as we talked about this was that I had a fabulous dinner in Cannes on a yacht with Halle Berry, a very unexpected <laughs> dinner with pictures. So I have proof, um, but we'll leave that for another day as John jumps to a question. And there was just 10 of you, right? This wasn't like a massive yeah, like 10 dinner. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, think you'll, I think you'll get some private messages about oh, how the heck did that happen? So anyway, welcome, Gary, and thank you for, for being with us today. So my question for you is, um, uh, during one of our earlier conversations, you had mentioned that your ERG um, was just launching in early March, um, just when the pandemic was, pandemic was really taking hold. So I'm sure you had a lot of ideas of how this launch was going to happen and then bam. So how did you shift and, and what happened during that, that period of time as you were launching? Sure, it was really an interesting period of time for all of us and I want to respect that and, and uh, know that we all have gone through a lot this year. Um, we were really excited. I'm the executive sponsor of Evoke Pride, which is our uh, LGBTQ plus um, employee resource group. We literally just kicked it off in February um, and that was off the heels of uh, what our CEO Todd Seawack had done, which was the CEO Day of Action and Understanding, where from a DNI standpoint, we, we dedicated an entire day company-wide to talk about bias, to talk about race, to talk about um, equality, LGBT issues, um, everything in the workplace. And so we, we had such momentum. ERGs at our company really just started um, last year, actually, with all Ola, our, our Hispanic resource group being the first and then subsequent one started. We kicked off on that momentum and then it's like four weeks in, boom, and we were done. And what are we doing? And we also, we know with it being in March, we'd, we'd gone down the path and our plans and communication to our leadership team and to uh, starting to do to employees, you know, what we were going to do in terms of messaging, communications, how we were bringing our new uh, vision and mission to life in the organization, how we were planning for pride and we were going to be in the pride parade in Chicago, how we were doing all these live events. Our, our, we have a community partner, the Center for Halstead in Chicago, and we were planning events with them, live things. I mean, everything just shut down like for all of us. So we had a shift. I mean, our, our, our vision is very much to celebrate um, everyone's pride and identity. So well, we are the uh, LG BTQ plus focused ERG, we really felt that our vision should be about identity because that, that's at the heart of us. And we wanted that to be what we help the whole organization do in terms of cross all of our employee resource groups celebrating the identity of the individual. Um, and we we're going to do that through employee experience, through education, through community events. And we just had to change it. What we found, I'll tell you, um, as we, as I, uh, learnings from that period were stay focused on what you were trying to accomplish. What was that mission we just kicked off? Don't be deflated. We didn't let ourselves be deflated. I think we got closer, fortunate to have, you know, two really awesome co-chairs of the group who were really in the weeds. We all got reconnected virtually, made sure we stayed focused, talked through what we would shift, how we would do it, um, what would the programming be. And we, as we converse here, I can talk more specifically about the programming that we ultimately did. And then, you know, when, when the sort of social injustice and the race, racism conversations came in, we had to shift again and pivot some of our programming for June. Honestly, it ended up being to our benefit. We got even more connected. The company had built off this energy almost of all the employee resource groups that the employee resource groups and us being the newest, everyone kind of became a place and a space for people to get together, go have a cocktail with the LGBT folks, have a cocktail with the OLA folks, get together and talk about how you're feeling, how's your team doing versus this team. Um, and the ERGs became a resource really for the organization in a way that I don't think anybody planned for or expected more so. So really, you know, I can dive into details, but we shifted and embraced really the change. Thank you, Gary. I, I can't imagine. We're all very planful people. Um, <laughs> so most of us are very planful. And to have that group kick off and then 
have to just reconnect everything and reconnoiter everything at that stage must have been um, really a, a challenge and something that probably gave you some juice and some some energy as, as well. Exactly. So um, anyway, we'll come back to that in a moment. Our third and final panelist is Tamara Peterson. And Tamara is not only a colleague, but she's also a friend. So um, Tamara, welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, we work together at Wells, of course. Um, I'd love for you to introduce yourself and then I'll jump in with a, a question uh, for you. Sure, thanks John. And, and thanks everyone for being here with us to talk about this important topic. Um, as John said, I'm Tamara Peterson. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I am an attorney for Wells Fargo in my day job, supporting our wealth business. And also I'm the enterprise president of our pride team member, uh, well, our pride employee group at Wells Fargo. Um, and my fun fact, I'm gonna be like Erica, super expressive, because I'm a singer. So, so you'll probably see a lot of hands getting thrown up in the air here in a little bit. I'm, I'm trying to, to refrain from all the hand talking that I tend to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we should have a talent show right after this with 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 a, a, an acting monologue, perhaps, and a singing contest. So um, we'll see if we can make that happen. <laughs> um, Tamara, you talk a lot about knowing knowing you as 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 I do. You, you, you talk about balance and connection a lot, and, and 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 rightfully so. And so balancing your own emotions while staying focused on the legal matters that you were you were dealing with at the time you needed to address uh, within your role as as president of pride and your day job I'd love to hear more about um, how you personally went through that that change and uh, how important uh, the, the important status of balance and connection had at that time and what you did to to um, to improve that for yourself and to get through this as gracefully as, as you have. Yeah, I think it's probably not surprising to anyone that, you know, we were all pivoting on a dime. All of a sudden, you know, we left our offices, um, at least in my location on Friday afternoon. And I had sort of at least had an inkling that something might be up and it wasn't looking good. And um, so I, I packed up a briefcase because I'm a, I'm a paper person. So. So I packed up a, a briefcase with a ton of um, paperwork and files that I thought, mm, I might need those. And sure enough, I haven't been back to my office since that Friday afternoon. So um, I was really focused in the beginning on, on two things, you know, the two teams that I'm responsible for, for helping to lead my team in the legal group, which I wanted to make sure they all felt safe and supported and getting their jobs done. And certainly for those who are parents, right, who are suddenly now managing the responsibilities of the workload, but also trying to figure out how to manage the childcare that they had lost yeah. um, and, and focusing then on the network. Um, 16,000 plus employees, we're, we're a very mature organization for our employee network. That's a lot of people across the globe to really be thinking about how do we help them, you know, as we as we shift into this time. I have to confess, sort of personally, I loved no longer having a commute. I didn't realize I was going to love it as much as I as I have. Um, I kind of worry about what that means when the when the world changes, you know. Um, but what I what I had learned about myself is that I had a really hard time stepping away from my work. Um, and I had to build some boundaries and that there's so much work to do, right? In my day job, in my gay job, <laughs> there's always stuff happening. And I was so worried about how everyone at the company was making this adjustment and caring for them. And what I think I discovered um, in spades was that I, I wasn't alone. Um, a lot of our leaders were also having these struggles. A lot of the leaders of, on the enterprise team were a little hierarchical in how we're structured. So we have a team that helps guide our pride network across the entire um, company. And then we also have a network for, um, we have chapter leaders that help lead the work in a, in a you know, more specific location or region. Um, and you know, all of them were doing what I was doing, which was not taking very good care of themselves. They were worried about taking care of everybody else. And we had actually had some programming that we had to shift because it had been scheduled for mid-March, right when 
we were all going into lockdown and everybody was trying to figure out how to make technology work for the company as we all made that, that huge shift. Um, we had had some programming scheduled for mental health and well-being for our specifically for our employee network leaders. And that had actually stemmed out of some programming from last year's summit where we saw mental health becoming such an important issue to focus on for leaders, especially to make sure they were taking care of themselves in addition to doing this important work. And um, that shifted to early May, which ended up being so fortuitous for us because by then everybody was in the thick of uh, having identified all the bad behaviors that, <laughs> that we needed to start addressing, right? And uh, you know, how do you set the boundaries? How do you make sure you're taking care of yourself? Um, getting up and moving around, getting food, uh, just taking a break from your screen, all of those things. And I have to say it was one of the most impactful programs for just for our network leaders. We had about 450 um, total leaders across our network. And they, so many came back and asked, how do we deliver this to our employees now, to our, our members? Because it's so meaningful and, and we wanna make sure that we're, we're getting them engaged and having them take care of their, themselves and their well, well-being in this same way. Um, you know, the one other thing I would say is we really shifted, and this comes as no surprise, right? How do we make, take advantage of this virtual environment? Um, we talked about the importance of continuing meetings, just even though we were limited in the beginning at what technology we could use because of bandwidth concerns, let's just have the call in. Let's just give people the space, right, to come in and talk about how they're feeling and to know this is a safe place to come in and say, I'm not, I'm not doing so well. I'm yeah. really feeling isolated, especially in our community. We found that was, um, that was a common, um, a common feeling that, that people were experiencing. And so, you know, focusing on how do we make sure in this virtual environment just to make the space using whatever the resources were that were available, I, I think was one of the, the most important um, aspects of, of how we addressed the shift early on. Thank you, Tamara. Uh, that's, um, uh, you cared for a great many people during this time. And, and I know that it was reflected in um, the engagement that we saw within the group and, and reporting people reporting that they uh, were doing better. And I, I wanted to bring something into the room with us today. And it was something that Amy uh, just brought up in chat that not all of us were fortunate enough to work from home. And many of our bank tellers and our frontline staff were um, asked to go to work still. And so while we're, we were fortunate that we, we weren't in that position, I wanna recognize that a great many employees around the world did not have that opportunity. And so Amy, I wanted to thank you for, for bringing that to us because as sometimes I get so insulated in what my experience was that I can forget what it was like for others. So I wanted to acknowledge that. Uh, uh, another another housekeeping thing. So I I'm no longer sharing my screen, as you probably know. And there's a, a lot of people in the room, 200 or so. So we're going to open up uh, throughout uh, our time together and ask your questions. So I'm kind of multitasking here. And if I miss one of your questions yeah. on chat, I apologize ahead of time. I'll do. I have got my three co-captains here who will also be monitoring our chat. Um, but wanted to open it up first before we open it up to the rest of the panelists to see if there's any any questions um, that that you wanted to ask us from from the start, and then we'll dive into some more uh, seated questions that I have for our panelists. So, any questions so far? John, there's a question in there. Uh, it says, oh, what, "What have been your biggest challenges as we became more isolated?" Um, and I'd say for us, it was, again, having just started and, and launching, was how do we communicate? How do we get the word out about what we're doing? So yes, the pivot in terms of our programming, but how do we actually communicate in and around the organization? And so we really need to quickly figure out Zoom back, background, Zoom chats. Uh, we, we used Workplace as our sort of community uh, conversation space um, socially, internally. 
across the company. We, we just had launched our own kind of Evoke Pride channel, but we then tapped into all of our uh, brothers and sisters at the other employee resource groups to tap into their channel and get word out about our events. We also made sure we had different events for different audiences um, so that if we were talking about uh, the importance of the LGBT uh, marketplace, we wanted to make sure that we targeted marketers who could understand the, the, the buying power of the LGBT community versus if we were doing something that was more social where we, we knew more people would maybe be interested in. We had a drag race happy hour with recipes uh, with some of our uh, candy brands uh, and it was fun and we tapped in again to our other employee resource groups from a communication standpoint. We also made sure we maintained our presence with our um, leadership team. I sit in the leadership team and fortunate to at the company um, but make sure that you know, our, ER, our, our co-chairs of our group showed up and presented what the plans were so that the various cross-functional leaders could communicate down in the organization as well. So communication was a big, big hurdle, and I, I think we overcame it. Yeah, it was it was tough for us um, too, and I'd love to hear from Erica and, and Tamara on this. But you reminded me of something that I had completely forgotten about, Gary. We we were not set up to have two hundred fifty thousand of our employees working remotely, and the VPN and the, the the connection. So not only were many of us working from home at that point at the in the early days, but we had technology restrictions. We couldn't use video for the first two or three weeks, maybe even a month. I don't remember it all uh, comes together, but we had significant uh, technology restrictions so that we could protect uh, our customers and keep that bandwidth open for our customer interactions. And um, And it was really tough because we had people saying, I need to connect, I need to connect, I need to connect. And our technology group was saying, "You can't right now." So it was it was a it was a tough road. We have sent we our technology team uh, quickly upgraded everything that needed to be upgraded. I don't the the who dads and the doohickeys all got got improved, and that was lifted at a relatively short period of time. But it was it, it was an added challenge. Erica or Tamara, any anything that you'd want to add about how we responded early? Yeah, you know what, um, I, I covered it in my earlier remarks, John, where I just said same thing with us. We were not tech, like from a technology standpoint, we had to really invest in a lot of infrastructure, but I just want us to make sure we're sensitive to time. I know other people are putting questions, so yep. I'll, I'll hold and, and answer one of the others. Okay, so there were, thank you, Tamara. There, there's a, another great question came in. These are all great questions. And, and I, I hope I'm going to throw away my script and we're just going to go to your questions. <laughs> so how's that feel? Um, a question came in, how have you maintained community engagement with philanthropic uh, partners in a largely remote environment? Uh, what a great yeah. question. And it's been really tough for us uh, to figure yeah. that out at the beginning. So Erica, I see you yeah. Uh, yeah. That's say fine. more about and that. Actually yeah, you know, but that, that was actually really challenging for us because a big piece of what we do with our EIGs is around volunteerism, right? And making sure that we make those opportunities available to, to the members and the workforce across the board. Um, so we really had to re-envision what partnership looked like. Uh, and so for us, for example, we have partnerships with the National Urban League and Girl Scouts and, you know, all of these different phenomenal organizations. So we really touched base and, and connected with them to say, how are you shifting your programming right now um, in a way that is safe thoughtful, responsive, um, and in a way that we could still be really good corporate partners um, and make sure that the connections are still there. So to the extent that we can do vir could do virtual things like, you know, we I know for um, one organization, we set up an entire day, a virtual tour of Centene. Um, and so essentially it was, we lined up executives from all across the, the company um, to really talk about, you know, to a group of young people, what it means to work in the healthcare industry. Um, and so we use that as an opportunity to do that. We also, you know, as a healthcare organization, felt like it was really a high responsibility to tap into the fact that um, African Americans and black and brown communities were being impacted by COVID-19 at a disproportionate rate than other communities. And so what does that look like for us? Um, and so we created a health disparities um, task force 
So that is something that was new to Centene. We went across the country and said, how do we make sure that we are relying on health experts from our nonprofit partners, our civil rights advocates across the country to say, help inform us, right? Help us figure out what can we strategically do to lead in this space to make sure that collaboratively we're creating the types of opportunities for our employees to participate. Um, so we have a number of projects happening in different states across the country that's really looking at how do we examine this disproportionality of COVID-19 um, and the death rates and even just, you know, those who have been um, sick from the virus. So I think for us, we just really, we, we partnered with um, other organizations to do blood drives. Um, you know, we knew that there were shortages. We said, okay, you know, we had employees who wanted to shift their volunteer time to say we want to volunteer. So we are, we have clinical frontline staff. You know, we're, like I said, keep saying we're healthcare. So we said, you know what, we re-envisioned our benefits policy to make sure that employees who wanted to, to go on the front line um, mm -hmm. and volunteer to participate, they had an opportunity to do so. So it was really like looking at a number of ways to create volunteer opportunities, to create more virtual connection opportunities, to look at new um, organizations with whom we perhaps had not partnered previously, to dig into the disproportionality and say, you know what, how do we create um, or, or at least examine ways to create more equity um, across healthcare outcomes, looking at things like social determinants of health and other pieces, um, and really just had to envision, even from a benefit standpoint, even we looked at our, our, our we call it SINVET, our Veterans and Military Families um, EIG to say, okay, they wanted to participate. So we actually created um, increased benefits for our reservists and others who wanted to volunteer during this time, during the pandemic, for them to participate. So we shifted a lot of our internal benefits and policies to make sure our employees still felt like they had opportunities to connect. That's awesome. To be able to move and react so quickly, I'm sure was uh, a Herculean effort. So that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> Gary or Tamara, anything that you'd like to to add to the what we did philanthropically or what you your company did uh, philanthropically during during this period of time anything to add i um, will but tamara you look like you're going to jump so jump <laughs> 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 thanks gary i um you know i i wanted to focus a little bit on the pride specific connections for the lgbtq lgbtq focused organizations i know you know, in some ways, we've had greater access with some of our partners to their programming because a lot of them have shifted from having in-person events to national events. And so we've worked to uh, promote those, those activities. But I think, I mean, frankly, for our network, the biggest impact was the connectivity to all the Pride Festivals. We show up uh, annually at over 60 in-person Pride Festivals and parades over, uh, I think it's over 100 in total festivals. Um, that you know, includes parades and non-parade events. And it was a huge hit for our employees who were already feeling isolated to then have Pride canceled, um, or at least the in-person Pride was canceled. And as we came into Pride Month and we started realizing, oh, we, we have to make a plan, right? We really wanted to think about how do we reimagine this? How do we make it meaningful? How do we make sure that our global workforce is engaged because we had people who participated in pride parades in Manila and in Canada, it was going to be their first year. And, you know, so for them, it felt like an even greater loss that they didn't get to participate. Um, and I will just, you know, I'm going to do a plug here for the coolest idea coming out of Minnesota, which happened in a chapter um, that the enterprise group took and, um, and reimagined <laughs> into this just really great event, which was shoebox pride floats. So people took shoebox, they made them into floats, they took pictures of them, and we strung them together in a video with running commentary that we shared late in the month. Um, it was such a fun way for people to get creative and to, you know, sort of share how they were feeling, the hopefulness. There was a lot of social justice that showed up and racial justice themes that showed up in our floats because, of course, right as we entered into Pride Month, we had, um, it was on the heels of the George Floyd killing and several other high profile racial incidents. And so it was really a great way to kind of capture the, the spirit of the 50th anniversary of the first Pride March that was so 
based in like this social justice movement, right? And led by these amazing trans women of color that were so participatory and to have our float so expressive again of that intersectionality, that support more broadly of the community, I, I thought was, was really compelling. Um, the other thing that we did, we have an internal social platform at Wells Fargo called Team Moments. It's a it's like a Facebook for the for the company. Um, but we really leveraged that as a place where people could go in and drop in, not just on calls, right? Because if you miss the call and then you hear the replay, it doesn't always feel quite as interactive. So we did blog postings and we had people have the ability to drop in whenever it worked for them. And we had, you know, pride booths like you would find at a festival and they covered things like, you know, ask questions about specific identities within the community to, to get a better understanding if there's, if there's something you don't uh, maybe have an understanding of or what's some great programming um, that's out there as far as media or books. Um, we had a tutu tutorial for people who wanted to make their own fancy tutus and we had a great session about um, the, the professional development that you can have from being, you know, from performing in drag, which shout out to my, to my Wells Fargo people who are doing a session tomorrow, or no, this afternoon, this afternoon on um, drag and professional development should be just a great conversation. But those were different ways to engage, right? Kind of tried to hit something for everyone. Um, we had a lot of discussion about intersectionality and really looked to draw that out as a, as a safe conversation space so people could feel like they could come and just talk about how they were feeling, you know, ways that they could better support their colleagues. Um, I think that really, that really helped us, especially given the, the particular loss that we were feeling in the month of June. So I'll stop yeah. there. I know Gary, you wanted to jump in too. So thanks for giving me a few moments to, to talk about Pride specifically. I think, I hope it's helpful for folks to kind of hear what different companies and, and how we've all kind of done things in this space. I mean, I think, you know, this convergence of the pandemic and, and the racial unrest in our country and all happening then in June, right? Again, Pride, we were supposed to be very celebratory and we wanted to do all those things, but we had to shift. We couldn't, we couldn't ignore what was going on around us. I mean, all of us had to do that. I think, you know, what we did as well, we focused on intersectionality as Tamara talked about too, and, and, and Derek, I mean, we, we celebrated uh, black artists and did black artist music sort of series throughout June. But then I'll tell you, all of our ERGs were just very active in, in helping the company have and confront what was going on. And our leadership are fortunate in the CEO who wanted and, and created a space to do that too. We, we celebrated Juneteenth and really took it as a day of, of solidarity for us as a company, company-wide, to take a pause, to have external speakers in for learning and training, to have breakout sessions across the company where, you know, ERG leaders um, were, were influential in terms of driving some of those conversations in the breakouts into smaller groups, but then employees from all across the company for every function were able to to engage and talk and just have the space that we all needed at that very, I don't know, a moment that I don't think any of us have, have you know, dealt with um, before. And I think that we were very brave as a company. We pride ourselves, one of our values at Ferrari is agility. Um, and we were very agile, but we also were very brave in terms of just having the right conversations, um, you know, around uh, the importance of identity, the importance of, you know, being actively anti-racist uh, and against racism versus passive, um, the importance of recognizing intersectionality, and we all have different hats we wear and how we show up, and, and, and really having the tough conversations. Um, and, and we've continued to do that. I mean, we, we, we've signed up um, you know, with Ascend, which is an organization focused on communities who are impacted um, you know, through COVID-19. Um, I know Out and Equal is, is also a member of Ascend. Um, you know, we signed up and are public around the Civic Alliance Partnership in terms of actively encouraging voting. And we are creating the space for our employees to volunteer at the polls and get out there and make change. So it's interesting, again, there was just momentum when we pick, we ran with the momentum and are trying, I think, to have impact across the board um, as much as we can. 
Thank you, everybody, for your insight in it. I think we're segueing into the, the racial equality and the social justice movement that happened. And I, I just want to make two shameless plugs for Wells Fargo and, and two of the things that we did. Um, uh, going back to what we did volunteer uh, in our volunteer corps and uh, through philanthropy, one of the we have lots of real estate, and we have lots of branches um, across the country and, and the world. And one of the things that we did pretty quickly was convert our drive-throughs into food distribution centers, um, which was a really uh, uh, wonderful thing for us to, to do. And we did that pretty quickly um, and, and we're really proud of that. And so in dozens of communities around the country, our, our drive-through uh, branches that were closed at the time uh, we turned into food distribution centers. The other, another cool thing that happened, and I'll segue into the, the racial justice, um, we hired a bunch of black artists to, to do some card redesigns. So as people were getting their new debit cards, um, we, were, we wanted to do something that reflected um, art and history. And so we um, created this new library of cards that people could could use um, for their debit cards and uh, that featured black artists. And so that was just another, another thing that happened. So let's move into the social justice movement. And uh, there was a question that came up um, around that. So uh, I'd love to hear more, Erica and Gary, you, you both touched on it a little bit, whoever wants to start us off. So when George, the George Floyd uh, killing happened, um, we certainly responded, Wells Fargo responded, um, and, and all the other instances that happened, and we responded, we can share certainly our story, but I don't want this to be the Wells Fargo hour. So if you'd like to share, um, Gary or, yeah. or Eric. Sure. I think, Gary, can you guys, I, I don't know if John froze. Yeah, I can still hear you. John froze. Erica, okay. I can still hear you. Okay. Guys. We can hear <laughs> you. Going. You go. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, you know, I, you know, just what John said, all of us really did pivot um, to really, you know, we were unprepared. Um, but I, I have to say this as an African American woman, um, we often really, you know, try to get everyone, our, our colleagues to understand and to empathize, to, uh, you know, to really you know, feel that black people in America, quite frankly, were living through two pandemics. Um, and that is something I think it's important to say, right? Um, because the reality is for many black Americans, you're already afraid to go outside, right? You're already making sure that you're putting on all these protective measures because what the country has now, you know, been forced to grapple with through, through tons of imagery, uh, just, you know, gruesome imagery um, is the reality that, that you know, African Americans across this country have lived with and, and experienced for forever. Um, and so I think that that is something that, you know, as corporate America, as, as companies, we also were called, you know, to really step up and say, well, what are we going to do? What role do we play? Have we done enough? to advance equity um, across the country. And so at Centene, you know, certainly um, in the wake of George Floyd, we launched um, Courageous Conversations, but we kicked it off with a day of dialogue that included our CEO, our board, one of our board members for Centene, because we wanted to show that at the highest levels of the organization, we're gonna have a very thoughtful and honest conversation about this. We're gonna talk about our values. We're gonna talk about what we won't stand for. Our CEO it was very, um, it you know made the news on our, on our investor day call. He, he said, black lives matter and we have to say that. It's, a, it's sad that we have to say that, but again, it really just, uh, underscored how important it is for at all levels of corporate America, your investors, your board members, your CEO, your executive leadership, and throughout, you have to take this on very directly. And so we were very intentional about making sure that all of those steps happened. And then, of course, making sure that we had conversations for the entire enterprise to take part in. We have now had over 100 conversations 
since the summer, and they're ongoing. We've created toolkits to make sure that all of our HR business partners are equipped to support business leaders in continuing to have these conversations. We followed up so that make, making sure that at an enterprise level, people knew this is not a one and done for us, right? Yes, we can talk about the significant philanthropic investments we'll make with, you know, organizations that are advocating for social justice and making sure to move the needle in communities of color. Um, but again, how do we make sure that what we're doing is creating the type of inclusive workplace, the type of pipelines that need to be developed and all of those things. Just on this past Monday, uh, two days ago, we did a follow up courageous conversation at the enterprise level where we talked about things like, you know, the fact that the, the federal government is taking the stand of not doing unconscious bias or racial sensitivity training. And we talked about voting and what, you know, we're talking about very honest, current events because that is now what, you know, when we are all at home, working from home, and we just, we have parenting, we have school, we have work from home, we have the election, a national election going on, we have a pandemic. I mean, uh, all of this is converged. And so yep. for us to simply stick our head in the sand is, is really to be tone deaf, to, to really not acknowledge that people are being inundated with so much happening in their personal lives that, you know, we have to acknowledge that and play a role. Um, and so that's something, like I said, we have done through really looking at our talent processes. We're doing things like, you know what, are we investing with minority banks? You know, are we, what, are we, what, are, what are we doing to make sure that we're not just talking about racial justice, but we're also talking about economic justice? Um, and so all across the board, you know, like I said, in, in terms of closing wealth gaps, um, what does that look like? Um, how do we make sure, like I said, that we're addressing health disparities? So uh, we really looked at this as an opportunity to, to self-examine um, what we can do internally and externally, but then to also empower our tremendous workforce to be the advocates to drive inclusion throughout our communities across the country and, and the globe, quite frankly. Gary, over to you in, in a moment. Companies lar as large as Centene and, and Wells Fargo and many other companies that I see that are represented in the rooms in Ferrara, um, we have a responsibility to change the world. And we, we are, our scope and our, and our breadth is big enough that we can change the world. So I'm really happy that Centene, like Wells Fargo, did, did some things to, to help affect that change. So Gary, over to you. I was just going to add, no, I, and Eric, I mean, I think the, the stuff you guys are doing is amazing. I think just building off of what I was saying too, like the fact that our CEO said, we're going to do a day of solidarity and that the leadership team always, you know, yes, we are, and we did it. And then we just keep going. I feel like I, I'd written notes in prep and I, it's interesting about change. I wrote down, like, we can make change happen. Like that, that's a feeling and it's amazing to be you know a member of a leadership team at a company where you know i'm telling you i've been around we, a lot of us have been around you know 10 years ago even i don't feel like you could have the conversations that i know we're having internally and I, it sounds like all of us on this panel are i mean i hope others are fortunate to either learn from it or be in places where you can help make that change happen um we we didn't have we don't have untouchable topics we we is, we took the momentum and we created um under our awesome uh VP of Diversity and Inclusion, Natasha, um, a DNI task force now, and and I as a, a executive and all of our my peers are our co-chairs at each one of the six pillars. We're doing things like supplier diversity, things that you know we're all in the works of stuff there. But now it's a very much. It's not a nice to have. It is part of our jobs as leaders, and we've taken that on and said we we will lead here. We we will have metrics like we do for everything else in our business against these things. We'll figure it out on the way. Um, and we're going to make change. We're going to, we're part of it. It's not, it's not, this is like my extracurricular kind of thing. Like, yep. It is as a leader uh, that we need to do it. Thank you, Gary. Um, it, it's, it really um, is such an important piece. And, and I'd love to get, Tamara, you're the president of, of Pride. And as an ERG leader, kind of divorcing yourself from your executive role and, and your and your day job and just thinking about your gay job as an ERG leader or ERN leader um, give us your perspective on on how we went through that and what we did as a company and what you did as a leader of an ERN yeah I think you know several things stand out for me the first and foremost is the importance of checking in with 
um, you know, just really, I think the black indigenous people of color, but also in our community, the trans non-binary queer identified members of the community who historically have suffered um, and at violence at a much higher rate uh, within our community and, and have felt a lot of similar oppression when they have interactions with others just day to day and you know with various policing and, and institutional systems i think you know there was a lot to be learned about and to really recognize and have self-awareness around um, around the privilege of you know that i enjoy as a woman who frankly you know doesn't necessarily walk into a room and have people think oh she's a lesbian unless I walk in and I'm holding the hand of my wife and I, I choose when I feel safe to do that. And you know, there's great privilege in that and recognizing, especially for our non-binary community um, and our gender diverse community that that's not a privilege that they enjoy as frequently and really thinking about how do we check in with them, right? How do we make sure we're just giving them space and not asking them to educate me about all of, you know, what, what does it mean, right? What is, tell me what the issues are that are in your community, but just giving them the space to talk and to know there was, there was a place for it if they needed it was really critical um, across, I, I think, you know, for leaders specifically. And then thinking about how do we bring this programming? How do we bring intersectionality into our discussions in a much more intentional way? Um, Certainly our Black African American uh, ERG was having conversations um, with senior leaders of the company, but you know, we, we all have an obligation to stand together here. And so how do we think about uh, making sure that we're not just allying across our letters, but we're allying across all of the identities. And so you know, we're working on, on programming and being really intentional about asking not only from an enterprise level for that to happen, but also at a chapter level to make sure that we're continuing to build on the momentum. And then um, I'm gonna say, you know, as, as a leader and <laughs> thinking strategically, I'm gonna, I'm gonna own up to being a little bit opportunistic here and saying there's a conversation and there's room for conversations to happen that where we have people's ears in a way that feels different. And so thinking about how do we leverage this moment to really talk about the issues that maybe, that maybe we haven't talked about enough or to talk about how slow change has been in coming, um, kind of meet the moment in a very strategic and thoughtful way, be really honest about what we're asking of our leaders. Because um, I, I think that we probably have been um, inclined to be more correct, right? Politically correct, we're in corporate America, how hard can we push? Um, and there's been some of the resistance that you may feel just in a general corporate setting, um, but there's a real opportunity here to lean in and to challenge maybe the edges of the conversation in a way that, that leaders perhaps haven't felt confident or comfortable doing before. And picking up on that conversation of being bold um, from earlier this morning in the plenary, I mean, I just, I think, you know, we're all here, our attendees are all here because we care so deeply about workplace equity and inclusion and thinking about how we can challenge ourselves as leaders to do better, to be more self-aware, to talk about others' experiences more broadly than just, you know, speaking from our own perspective and really bring that to bear in a more meaningful way across our companies and for all our employees, I, I think is a, a real opportunity that I would encourage people to, to think about how they can leverage. And you know, it, for people who have been at a few summits, 2018, there was a great summit keynote by Amber Hicks, who, um, or Amber Hikes, sorry, and she's, you can search it, Weaponized Privilege 2018 Summit, mm. talks about how it's incumbent on all of us to do the work, right? It's not up to the Black African American employee to be the only person fighting racism or to have the women fighting um, misogyny. We, we are so in this together and we all have accountability for amplifying each other's voices. So just, you know, shout out from that past summit that has stayed with me for years, obviously. I think um, one thing that I resonated with when 
you were speaking, Tamara, was this is a real opportunity for there, there's something different about this period of time that um, it just feels different. And I don't know what the outcome is going to be, but there is so much energy. And, and at Wells, as many of you may know in the press, our, our CEO, um, the day after the George Floyd incident killing, uh, I don't want to say incident, the killing happened, um, he called our, the president of our Black and African American Connection, uh, ERN, and wanted to have a meeting with that entire group. And so a question has come in that I, that I want to pose to the group. So we had this, we had a listening session with our CEO and he, his question was to our, our, our the, the black folks that work here is, what is it like to work here as a black person? What is it like as a black person to work at Wells Fargo? What a powerful question. And shortly after that, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, as a matter of fact, he was quoted um, in, in some press and the story was picked up about um, a lack of black um, uh, from, from that. And um, so I, I wanted to bring that into the room. We know that it's here and, and we, we certainly don't wanna make this a, 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 about that. And it's another opportunity as Tamara was saying, um, something is changing. The conversation is maturing. And I can't wait to see one year from now, three years from now, the effect of all of that change. Um, just, it's, it's, it's been an amazing. So the question that I wanted to pose to you, and it came from one of our attendees. So Alex, thank you for asking this question. There have been a lot of points from a corporate wide level, but what have individual chapters or sites done to further develop connections within the ERG and push other team members and the company forward? And I'm going to assume this is about racial equality and racial justice and anti-racism. And what would they have done differently to better achieve that? So I'll just throw that out to our panelists and see who wants to go first. I, I don't mind talking about Great. our, our chat. One thing that we did um, throughout this time was launch more local chapters. And I think that is important because it's where the rubber meets the road, right? That's where you can see real change happening. Um, and so we have partnered our EIGs with the, our talent attraction team to really grapple with this question of equity and pipeline development. And I think this also speaks, John, to your point just about you know, what came up with your CEO statements and otherwise. We're saying, how are we being very intentional about our sourcing and how do we leverage our EIGs, um, the chapters, to drive change throughout the organization? Um, and so we put our, to our talent attraction team had to, they now, we put a process in place where they now have to present on a monthly basis to all of our EIGs about their hot jobs <laughs> um, and about, you know, because we want to be thoughtful about diversity and leverage the strength of our EIGs. And so our EIGs now are really intimately involved in the talent pipeline process to make sure that they're incentivized for, um, you know, suggesting and, and, and offering up diverse talent. They are really connected. We also have our EIGs, like you heard, really um, with direct line of sight and access to our senior leaders of the company to make sure that, hey, they are educating leaders, right, is that this reverse mentorship theory that you sometimes hear about is making sure that <laughs> chapters can drive change. Um, and then we really ask all of our EIGs to think about, you know, other opportunities and how in terms of how the company can drive the change that would make it more inclusive for them. So we did things like, you know, our, we heard from our EIGs about what they wanted. They wanted a diversity index. So now our employee um, engagement survey, our big annual one has a really robust diversity index. These are all, we really, we created innovation subcommittees and all of our EIGs to say, what can you, what do you want to see us do, right? What could be innovative and thoughtful change? So I'll, I'll stop there. I don't want to take all the time, but we really leaned on our EIGs to drive change throughout the organization. Thanks, Erica. One, you reminded me I'm afraid we lost John. Oh, and he's back. I, I, I want everyone to know that I have been kicked out of better parties than this. So, <laughs> so there you go. Um, 
Oh. Tamara, I didn't want to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, no, John, you're, you're freezing up just a little bit. I was actually going to see if, if Gary wanted to comment next, and I'm happy to go. I, 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 I don't have much to add because we're very uh, much focused from a corporate standpoint. We're not as uh, diverse in locations as you all are. John, if we've got a good connection, do you want to go and then I can, I can supplement? Uh, sure, uh, but I'm, I'm, I, I clenched up because I, I keep getting kicked out, so I'm sorry. Uh, I think I might have lost my train of thought. One of the things that we did around the pandemic, Alex clarified his question around, um, not only around racial justice, but also during the pandemic. One of the really cool things that our learning and development partners helped us do that we launched throughout all of the chapters uh, when the pandemic was first getting started, we created a listening workshop, and I think some of the other group members, uh, panelists, have, have talked about this. And, and this was just around the pandemic, but it was around the, uh, you, you might remember the same storm, different boat analogy that um, some people were using when the pandemic was, was getting started. And, and Erica mentioned the, the, the disparity between different uh, communities. So we wanted to have, we wanted to create a listening session that we launched throughout all of our chapters in the in ER, ERN world um, that was focused on the same storm, different boats, and how people were getting through the pandemic to understand um, how different people were dealing with different sets of circumstances. So that was, that was really cool. So we did that throughout all of our chapters or as many chapters as we wanted, it wasn't mandatory. Um, we did something very similar when the, the anti-racism uh, wave started here at Wells Fargo and, and created a different, a, a similar workshop based on, 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 on racial issues and uh, having listening sessions throughout all Lines of, lines of our business at the brand, at the branches and within the ERN world. So um, just wanted to offer that up. So thanks. And I'm sorry that I keep getting kicked out. I'm not sure why that's happening, but yeah. Tamara, over to you. No worries. Um, so for our chapters, I mean, we saw a, a lot of different ideas. Some, frankly, was just, you know, encouraging our chapters. And, and I know they were continuing to have success with hosting their regular, you know, sort of business meetings, if you will, which are really just meetings of the group to talk and connect. They, they might be talking about some things that they were planning for, but when COVID hit, all the planning sort of went out the window, right? And so it was really about saying, don't, don't let everything about this structure go out the window with the planned events that we have to put a pause on or, you know, try to figure out how to reimagine. Let's still have these meetings. Let's still make sure that in fact you're giving space to people to have this opportunity to connect in a telephonic setting which is the best we could offer in the moment right when it hit and that really translated well i think for us as as the months continued to evolve and the issues continued to evolve that we had those those opportunities but then we we had some chapters do some really cool creative stuff they send out email newsletters to their members on a fairly regular basis, a couple, you know, one, once a week or every other week. And many of our chapter leaders um, started doing work from home Q and A sessions, sharing some fun information, asking members to write in and share some fun information. It was just a different way to connect than what we had seen before. And frankly, I don't know that we would have been really excited about, oh, let's have more emails <laughs> with this kind of information. if we could all get together in a place and have those conversations. But given that that was absent, the work from home series that happened, um, the creative ways in which people found, you know, to share information, to share pictures, to share experiences, I think, you know, to help breed that connectivity in just a different way for people for whom that might feel um, more, uh, impactful. I, I think the, you know, we, we started having sharings across our chapter leaders to talk about how were they building connection and getting them to share best practices as well, because, you know, lots of diverse ideas from a, a diverse group of leaders was great for us. You know what, I, I can build on that just one quick thing too, I thought was really great. Our Inspire, our women's network, um, they launched a coffee break series, which I thought was really cool for all the different chapters. And it was just a quick way, like literally it's every week, it's like 30 minutes, but you have hundreds of people, just different people coming in because that's what you miss when you, you don't have the coffee break rooms in work. So they're just able to just quickly connect, jump in. We had our, that same EIG host a parenting during the pandemic. 
session. We had Mosaic, which is our multicultural um, network, really think about, you know, what does it mean for mental health? Right, like for all these, we talk about you know these all of these challenges with, with surviving a pandemic, um, but really, like I, I agree with Tamara, the programming has just been so creative and cool that I think you know perhaps would not have been imagined but for the situation that we're living through. Exactly right. One thing that I remembered and a great lesson learned from uh, that that I got, and I'm sure others will shake their head vigorously, when you're having those lis listening sessions, it, we did so at the beginning without the benefit of having our health and wellness group or our HR in the room, and it was a real opportunity once we included those kinds of resources that we could talk about what benefits are available to our employees. So it wasn't just a listening and a dumping session. It was also an opportunity for us to share what benefits and are available if people are are needing mental health assistance or yeah. um, other things too. So uh, just bear that in yeah. mind if you have these listening sessions to to get the right people in the room to to help guide that that conversation. Yeah. Sure. You know what's what's interesting too, John. Our multicultural network released a multicultural cookbook. Um, because awesome. everybody was at home cooking, they like they thought it was really creative to say, you know what, look, let's share recipes. And so we literally created a our mosaic EIG created a multicultural cookbook. It was great. That's it was great. awesome. We've had, we've had some people who've set up like virtual walks or virtual exercise challenges with groups, right, to get together and try and motivate each other. So they set up a time, thirty minutes. Let's all go take a walk and we'll just talk about what's happening or stress relief. Um, I think lots of creative ways that chapters can really emphasize engagement and well-being at the same time. Yep. So we have a question that came in and I'll, 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 um, I'll read this aloud to you. Uh, please speak on how your organization support mid-level managers to get the meat of the business done while also making room for important work of the ERGs. Many of us have full XCOM support in DNI. But the breakdown comes when our work week, work week is shared with the ERG work. Clearly, both are critical. Please share your solutions and if your manager training is the solution. Mm -hmm. So we call this at Wells Fargo our frozen middle, right? The managers who, um, we get it at the top, we get it at the employee level, it's the <laughs> managers who need to make space for this work to happen. And at Wells and at other organizations where I've worked, um, we try not to make the ERG work ancillary to a day job. It is our day job, and especially if you're a leader. So we spend a lot of time and energy focusing on our managers to, um, to be really aware of that, that this, is, this, this helps their, their direct reports engagement. It helps build competencies in situations that they might not normally have. Um, it helps them build influencing and negotiating skills and delegation skills. It, it does nothing but great things for a manager to build in their direct reports opportunities and competencies that they might not normally have in their other job. So I think the, the, most, the more that we can do in stop separating the day job from the gay job and, and ERG work um, as, some, as something separate and distinct will all be very well served. So I'd love to hear what um, some tactical um, solutions to that from our panelists. Yeah, I, I just add, I mean, I totally agree. I mean, I think the thing that we've done and I've seen us do it very well, again, our, our ERG network is only a year old and we've kept expanding, but the fact that we have executive sponsors, the fact that we show up at events, um, we encourage it. We People know that we have on a rotating basis at our, our weekly leadership team meetings that we have ERGs on the slate of topics to be discussed. And, and, and those folks who are leaders within the ERGs come in and talk about the work that they're doing. They seek engagement from us and ask us to participate. We communicate in our internal channels about it. So, I mean, it is that old, you know, top down kind of thing. I mean, the bottom and the middle are, are doing so much work in this area in the company and they're so passionate about it. If top management didn't encourage it, support it, make sure that folks know it's valued, 
they wouldn't be able to to do it and be as successful, honestly, as they are. So I think it's really important to make sure that senior leaders ensure that middle managers know how valued it is um, that we want this. Because yeah. the the folks that the folks in the organization who are at least for us who are engaged, they're really engaged. They're really passionate about this. They want to do stuff. So make it part of the day job. Yeah. I, I think I, the only things that I would add um, that we've been very intentional to do is we have scoped out how to bring diversity and inclusion into all of our people plans. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is making sure to say, you know what, utilize EIGs, the events, the programming or what have you in your people plan. Um, and so let's be that intentional about making sure that we're connecting it. We also have done work to make sure with all of our people leaders that you know what, when people step up and take leadership positions in our EIGs, that they recognize that when it's time for performance reviews, that we are, we are saying that this is added responsibilities. And so people, like you said, Gary, this is developmental opportunities as well. Um, and so what are we doing as a company to make sure to acknowledge the time and effort and energy that goes into leading these, these very powerful and meaningful groups for the organization? The last thing I'll say is we have been thoughtful to make sure to open up opportunities for all of those um, leaders in, throughout all of our EIGs, chapters, and the like that are unique and distinct for them. So they have access to development programs, whether that's women's development programs or multicultural, just whatever, you know, culturally competent professional development to make sure that we, they are matched with mentors, that we are building up, that because we want to make sure that our leaders of our EIGs um, have the bandwidth and the support behind them from the organization to leverage all that they offer to the organization. Thank you, I think you made a Tamara. great point, Erica, yep. about the objectives, you know, including it as part of their overall annual appraisal process. We've been really intentional about getting that included as objectives for our leaders. It's something they can add in. So my peers maybe have three business objectives. I have four because I lead an ERG and, and want to make sure that that work is incorporated in. One thing I've done as a leader that um, has been really actually beneficial is find ways to get supportive managers on the radar of their managers. So when I have a leader as part of my team and they spend a lot of time working on pride work, coming to a strategy session, coming to Out and Equal, you know, there are moments that I will send a note to the manager of that person with a CC to their manager saying, thank you for supporting my leader. They did whatever, right? It was really critical to our success, but your support is what enables that to happen. It, I think, reinforces for them the importance of this work. It also puts them on the radar of their, of their leader, and it gives my leader two up visibility, right, for the right. work that they're doing. So there's a whole lot of ways in which it just makes a lot of sense to make sure your recognition is moving up the stream to try and help reinforce that this is valuable work for development, but also valuable work for the company um, and its various inclusion efforts. And then the last thing I would say for that sort of, you know, how do you show value? Encourage your leaders and encourage your members, frankly, to go and talk to their managers about, here's the programming. This is what I was exposed to in my employee network group. And I think our team could benefit from having a conversation a lot of networks develop pro programming in a way that can be um, redeployed within the business to have their own diversity-based discussions. And that's, I think, just another great way to show, to show that value. Thank you, Tamara. Uh, right, I, I think the, the point here, there are systemic things that can happen to support the ERN, and then there are the grassroots things that need to, that that happen like sending a note to a manager's manager thanking them for that space and Tamara has been extraordinarily talented and and uh, as a, as a leader to to do that so um that, that so thank you for that we had a question come in and we may not have a a really great answer for you Riano and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name uh, uh, someone wrote we are going to launch our pride ERG in my country what would you suggest to us uh, to make this meaningful and high impact on our employees? So um, I'll just open that up to the floor. And I know many of us have launched chapters outside of 
the U.S. and have launched ERGs. Um, Gary, you may have some great insights as you have just started implementing or executing on the on the Pride Group within Ferrara. So yeah, I'll start I mean, with I, you, Gary. Sure. I mean, I've been I was co-chair of the Out Group at SE Johnson years ago, involved in when I was at Time Inc., Time Warner, and then at Mondelez, and then now here at Ferrara. So, I mean, I think the consistent theme for me of being at different companies that might be applicable is just be clear on why you exist. What's your mission? What what are you standing for? What don't bite off more than you can chew at the start. Make sure you've got clear sort of pillars, whether it's education or awareness, things that are relevant to your particular audience and your country as you you show up and, and launch. Um, and then make sure you have clear metrics against it so that you're measuring yourselves in terms of the impact you want to have. Um, and I think that that can go a long way, having that, it's literally the one page kind of vision with your pillars and clarity so that your programming then comes off of it um, and that you're able to, to show people that you have a strategy and a purpose for being. I, I would add um, stories, 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 stories. It, the more you can tell stories as you launch um, and are exposing you know, this network and the focus to employees who may not have even, you know, had conversations about LGBT, the LGBTQ community in the past. Storytelling is hugely impactful, especially to managers um, who, you know, you want to make sure you're engaging and to allies. And I, I would suggest if there's anything we've seen from our international chapter launches, it's the importance of making sure everybody knows they're welcome and that um, allies are incredibly important to the conversations we have and to moving inclusivity forward for everyone. Yeah, and the only other point that I would make is that um, for, for every chapter launch that we um, take on, resources. You, you have to have dedicated resources. If this is something that's important to the company, um, you have to put the resources behind it to make sure that you can stand up the type of programming um, to lead to the impact that you desire. Yeah, that's a that's a great addition, Erica. Welcome back, John. I got to pay my bill, apparently. I, I, so <laughs> my payment got lost in the mail. I don't know what's going on. But apparently, this is a known issue that's happening with panelists on, on this platform. So I really do pay my bill. So if any Comcast people are out there, don't don't come find me. Um, I won't comment because I don't know what was just shared. So let me uh, reopen the chat and see where, uh, where we are. Um, yeah, oh, Scott, I saw in the chat you you invited people, allies, to share coming out stories. We actually are doing that as well. We thought it was really, it was really impactful to not just tell the, the stories of our employees, but to tell the stories of allies and how they continually come out to support our community. Love, love, love that idea. Yep. Thanks for sharing that and getting it in the room. And good luck, Rihanna, with your, your chapter. Yeah it's especially if you're in a country where uh, being gay is not as accepting as it is in other countries it can be quite the challenge and I don't know if anybody mentioned this but I think what Gary said and the little bit that I heard from Tamara I think it's equally as important that the members in that in in that country are doing a lot of the effort if it feels like a corporate initiative um, you may not get as much traction as if um, you have members sort of driving it and certainly being guided by um, your DNI office. But when it's member driven, I've seen in my experience that it's it's a bit more, um, it has a bit more traction. So um, Brandon asks, are you doing anything for LGBT History Month? We are doing facts on Slack and trivia, but would love to hear if you did anything more or anything new. So I'll, I'll open that up to our panelists. We are, we're, we're putting out sort of, you know, trivia facts, things from individuals. So I'll, I'll be doing one, but it, we're encouraging lots of folks, whether you're part of the community and are an, an ally on our internal platform to communicate something from a historical standpoint to just get, you know, people up, up skilled or educated if they don't know some stuff. Um, and also some fun facts and different things to get a conversation going. So it's quite, you know, basic it seems, but I think it, it gets the conversation going. So it's one, and I see somebody else says that that's what they're doing. Yeah, and we have a lot of our chapters actually are sharing um, 
some facts and figures, some history that's relevant to their specific regions, which I think is really great to see. You know, we compile that and we did a, a significant history presentation as part of our Pride Month programming. So we don't have anything really specific planned at the enterprise level beyond, you know, calling attention to it and talking about some of the high level um, information. But we're, we're weaving that in with stories, you know, for coming out day and also we're a big supporter of spirit day in the company. So we're, we're trying to encourage people to turn themselves purple and that we have the ability to do that with our pictures. Um, and so we're trying to, to have people be a, a sea of purple. And then of course, watching all the great information being pulled together and shared from our various chapter locations. As, thank you, Tamara and Gary. Uh, one question that, that I've had that I think is coming up more and more often, and I think someone in chat mentioned it early, is this issue of fatigue. Uh, I know I'm feeling really tired these days. My mental acuity is not as sharp as, well, it's always been questionable, but it perhaps not as sharp as it has been in the past. Um, and I think that there's some organizational fatigue that's happening. There's there's a lot of change and we're adjusting to a lot. And um, so maybe we could have a, a, to close us out, how we're overcoming some of that fatigue or how we're living uh, with some of that fatigue organizationally and, and personally, maybe we can close up our, our time together on that, on that topic or whatever else you'd like to talk about. And we certainly have a few minutes for some other chats to come in and if you wanted to talk about anything else. Yeah, well, one thing I'll say is, um, is that, you know, you're right, John, I think, I think 2020, I'm just, I've, I continue to hear so many people just saying, I'm done with 2020. Like, I'm just, I'm just done with 2020. I'm over right. it, right? We just can't wait. We're in the fourth quarter. Let's just get through it. Um, so I think that's true. And I think it's fair to just say that. Um, but what I, what we, what we try to do through all of our EIDs is to look at some wins. Right. If we can just dig in, we're trying to be um, as we prepare for the end of the year to say, what have we done in this crazy, most unprecedented year um, that we can be proud of that could still give us some energy. And, and one thing I, you know, I didn't mention earlier that we were able to do with C Pride, that's our LGBT Q plus network um, is that we were able to expand options, right? We did gender identity. We took, we flipped our work, uh, our workday system to make sure that more people can self-identify. And we did things around the use of pronouns and, and making sure that, you know, when people on board to the company that, you know, just tons of ways to make sure that we are being fully respectful of all the different dimensions of diversity that our workforce brings in. And so how do we highlight that in this moment of fatigue to say, to say yes, this has been hard for us, but we have used this time to dig in and really create powerful, sustainable change. Um, and that's something that I think we can be proud of and hopefully something that we'll continue to lean into um, to take us in, you know, through, throughout 2020 and into 21. It's, uh, focusing on the wins. What a great way to keep yeah. energy yeah. and enthusiasm up. Yeah. Gary, Tamara, anything you'd like to offer on that? I just say, I mean, I mean, we've been, I as a leader and other leaders across the company managers, you know, create the space, let people have some time. Like we've been very fortunate that people recognize that there's a lot of balancing going on and balancing really doesn't happen. There's just a lot going on and there's a lot of stress. And so be cognizant of that with your teams, your peers, your managers even, like it goes both ways. And, and make sure that you've got that acknowledgement of the need for space and different working hours even, or maybe it's not the highest quality and you're not gonna get that deck exactly like you want it, it's okay. I mean, I, just some of that basics, I think. But then we're also our Emerge ERG, which is our Young Leaders ERG, um, in, in, with World Mental Health Day being this Friday, they've actually put together awesome sort of space and programming to, to allow us to just have a company-wide conversation around this topic of mental health, because we yep. all need it. Yep. <laughs> Thank yeah, you, Gary. And, you know, John, the only thing I would add, I think those are great ideas. And I, for ERG leaders, one thing I would say is, um, as you're caring for your employees that are part of your groups, 
making sure that the company leadership sees the value in continuing to create this space, continuing to create the connection. You know, hopefully that should be a given, but truly the engagement that you can offer um, and the ability to have that engaged and connected feeling, stay with your employees and frankly, keep your employees through tumultuous times. I, I don't think that can be overstated here. So, um, you know, making sure that you're asking for the support that you need as a leader for your network is critically important. Beautiful point. One of the things that, that you reminded me of is I try to tell as many people who will listen to me, you're doing enough. And, uh, and you're doing enough. And, and I think that just people breathe after they hear that. And I think we all, for those of us who do this kind of work, we want to do more. And uh, we, you know, we're, we're sort of social work wannabes uh, in, in some regards. And, um, and I've had to come to the place where I'm doing enough. Today, I'm doing enough. So um, I am so grateful that all of you took the time, our panelists, to be here. Um, uh, you have provided me some great thought and, uh, and certainly your friendship and partnership over the last couple of weeks has, has made a great difference in my life over, the, uh, over this short period of time that I've gotten to know you. So thank you for fighting the good fight and for being here. Um, I really appreciate